at the last time we were here. They gave me letters and I haven't seen them in years. Because they, because I know for a long when they when they started, they were having uh, um, problems with uh, you know, getting the distribution going. But now it's the, the guy that did it is a pretty interesting guy. He just started in his basement and uh, you know uh, didn't really know too much about putting the magazine together. And the thing just went you know, blew up. So uh, it's a good looking magazine. That impressed me. About it. Yeah, uh, it really uh, from the first issue to <coughs> what it is now, it's just like. Uh, that's a stupid question. <laughs> uh, I guess just you know, we can start off with you know a little, or maybe a little bit of background on yourself, you know, if possible. How you get started playing and all that good stuff. Okay, long, long, make a long story short. I went to see Ricky Nelson when I was about twelve years old yeah. in Miami. My parents took me to a Ricky Nelson concert. So. Had to be a guitar player. I wanted to play guitar just like Ricky Nelson. So we went home, they gave me guitar lessons, and I studied for about two years, I guess. But I wasn't playing any Ricky Nelson songs. I was playing Home Home in the Range and learning how to read and all that stuff, and I really didn't like it. So I quit. I guess about four years later, I saw the Beatles and Dave Clark Five. Remember when all the English bands were yep. on the Ed Sullivan show right. almost every week? And I saw Dave Clark, and I saw Ringo, and I said, boy, that looks like a lot of fun. I love that music. And I started just playing around the house. And they said, okay, we'll buy you a drum. We'll buy you a snare drum, my parents said. But you've got to take some lessons. And I thought, here we go to guitar lessons again. I'm going to have to learn how to read and all that stuff, and it's not going to be fun, and that'll ruin it all. So I said, okay. And I took a couple of drum lessons, and it started to get to be learning how to play bossa novas and yeah. all that kind of stuff. And I didn't want that. I wanted to play like Ringo and Dave Clark. So he got me the snare drum and I said, look, honest, I'll practice and all that. And I just kept listening to guys and trying to copy what they did. And it just sort of evolved from there. Mm -hmm. this, is at, uh, this, this is when you were what, like 12, 13, 17? Well, by this time I was 15 or 16 when I started playing the drums. Yeah. And I had a snare drum and a cymbal the kind of little cocktail set you yeah, yeah, symbol yeah, and yeah, little stand. Right. So I used to play along to Roy Orbison Records and uh, who else? Gene Pitney, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Just playing along. I didn't know what I was doing, but I thought I was keeping time with them, or it felt like what I was doing was right. And uh, I connected with a few guys in high school yeah. who played a couple of guitars, and they sang. I was the only guy who was even close to a drummer around, so they said, why don't you be in our group, or we'll, we'll practice, we'll do some things. So I went over with my snare drum, my little cymbal, and we actually made some music. I think yeah. the guys knew two or three chords, and I knew one or two different drum beats, and we played for four or five hours, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and then I bought a set. I got a bass drum and a couple of tom-toms, and they got a little better. And I sort of fooled around in bands for Oh, I guess four or five years, maybe. Mm -hmm. We got a little better, I got a little better, learned a few more things and like that. And it just, well, then I started working for a record company. I was working for a record company on the side. Like retail record sales? No, in the warehouse. I started working in a record distributor's warehouse. Yeah. Shipping of records and all mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And then I worked my way up in that organization while I was playing music part time. And I got to, uh, went from the warehouse to working as uh, a copy boy mm -hmm. for the department and then I got to be a traveling salesman mm -hmm. selling records on the road and doing gigs at the same time with the band. I'd work during the week selling records yeah. and then come home on the weekends and then go off somewhere else with the band and work on the weekend and then, and then I was into promotion, I did local promotion and we handled, the company I was with in Toronto was Quality Records and they handled a lot of big labels, A&M and Atlantic. And so I got to hang out with guys like the Young Rascals and the Vanilla Fudge. And Long Island people. bands. That's right. <laughs> they were very big in Toronto. Yeah. And guys like Wilson Pickett came through town and all the stacks full of oh, people. Yeah, all those things. And I was the local promo guy mm -hmm. while I was playing. So, I mean, this was great. I got yeah. to hang out with them, take them to dinner and all that stuff. Did you ever run into a poker team MGs for that at all? Not when I was in promotion. 
but uh, so I went through all that, and then uh, I got to be an A and R man mm -hmm. for the company. Very small basis, but was the A and R guy for Quality Records. Mm -hmm. A and R signing up artists for the company, yeah, and producing, doing mm -hmm. some producing. Yeah. And I was still, this is still, I was, I guess, 20, 21 years old then. And playing, but I've been in the warehouse for five years. I worked my way up in right. a record organization for five years and playing music. Mm -hmm. And it was so it was a very large distribution company, Quality Records. They had maybe 50, 55 percent of all the hit records. Yeah. It was a big, big company. They distributed all the big labels. I think just about except Columbia Capital and you know RCA. They had just about all the independent labels. Mm -hmm. So they decided they wanted to start making their own records. And uh, I started producing a few local acts, and not much really happened, but I got a lot of experience in the studio. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I guess the first studio thing I did was a group that I put together uh, based on sort of a, I guess it was a studio group, you'd call it like the Archies or mm -hmm. that kind of a thing. And the best drummer that I could find to play on it was me. Mm -hmm. I found that I was the only guy who played sim simply enough and understood enough about pop records and music, sort of the combination of the two, and uh, produced myself as the leader of the group and the producer of the group, the A&R men at the record company, and, you know, the whole... <laughs> One man, yeah, that's, Jack right. Right. That's, right. that's right. And we had a pretty good sized hit record in Canada, and it just started happening in the States. We were all... What was it? It's a record called You're Gonna Miss Me, and the group was called Wishbone. Mm -hmm. And it was almost a dead cop of the grassroots, mm -hmm. the grassroots sound. Right. The tune was very similar to Midnight Confessions, and the sound of the group that I was after was a very pop commercial thing. And the grassroots were, you know, yeah. a good thing to go after. And I went after it, and I came pretty close, almost too close. Did you uh, write the song? Uh, I helped. I didn't get any writer's credits, but yeah. I was involved in the whole. Mm -hmm. I got a friend of mine who was a song sort of a songwriter, and he, I gave him a bunch of records. I gave him some Tommy James and Shaw Dells and some uh, Grassroots and some of the other, you know, commercially successful people at the time. Mm -hmm. And I said, write some songs like that. Paul Revere and the Raiders, the whole kind of thing. So he did. He wrote some pretty good songs. And we had a top 10 record in Canada. We made a deal with Scepter in the States. Mm -hmm. And the record was just starting to cook. I mean, it was on like 150 stations in the States, and it was, it was, uh, Oh, I think it was a number one record in Tucson, and it was really happening in some places. And then the Grassroots released a record called Sooner or Later, yeah. and our records just <laughs> died. Nah. Yeah. All the radio stations it, it wiped it. decided that they wanted to play, if they're going to play a Grassroots record, they wanted to play the Grassroots, and not some band from Canada that sounded like the Grassroots, yeah. and I can understand that. And the record was great. Sooner or Later was a fabulous record. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, next question I want to ask you, as far as growing up in Canada, um, all that music that was coming out of the States, what was, you know, is there, well, what was it, you know, like, um, you're talking about, uh, how do I phrase my yeah, the influx right? of music, musical ideas seem to become more into Canada, I think, than, than Yeah, was it, was it like frustrating or was it like a maybe desire to move to the States or, you know, people, you know, musicians growing up in Canada, what, uh, well, Toronto is a very interesting city musically, mm -hmm. and it always has been. It's yeah, always part of my ignorance. Cause yeah. No, no, absolutely. No, no, don't worry about it. Uh, not too many people know that much about it because mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff that went on there, and still a lot of the stuff that goes on there, stays there. Right. People who are in the very successful in the folk scene, very yeah. successful in the pop scene. People like Coburn, Bruce Coburn. <clears throat> well, we're going back a few years now, yeah. talking about Neil Young okay. and Gordon Lightfoot. And well, Gord's not a good example because he stayed there, but a lot of the people, the Steppenwolfs, right. and people like that, that really grew up in Toronto, mm -hmm. as soon as they reached a certain level of success, they moved to the States, right. which was natural. I mean, they, there are a lot of problems with Canada. It's a, it's a very large country with a very small population mm -hmm. relative mm -hmm. to its size. And to do a cross-Canada tour of all the, you know, the big cities, you go from... Right. Montreal to Toronto to Winnipeg to Vancouver. I mean, there's like four, four, four or five very large cities mm -hmm. in Canada, and you have to travel 
three, four thousand miles to cover those four cities where in the states, like you do New York and Philadelphia and Washington and Boston. And, right. You know, I mean, you can live forever almost in the East Coast. In Canada, you've got to travel forever to get to people. Mm -hmm. So it's right. very tough for bands to, I mean, just economically. Yeah. And also the record business, as far as producers and managers and things like that, it all came out of the states. Mm -hmm. But as far as the musicians are concerned, Toronto's a very big jazz town. Yeah. It always has been. And it's always attractive and has always developed very, very high level of confidence in the jazz field. There are a lot of jazz players. Yep. yep. And a lot of people, there are a lot of great, great jazz players. A lot of great jazz drummers, bass players, guitar players, mm -hmm. piano players, you name it, coming out of Toronto. I think it's one of the jazz cities in North America. So there's a very high level of musical confidence. Until recently, until the last 10 years, there was a very low level of confidence in the record, producing of records and managing of groups out there, mm -hmm. only from inexperience. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of copying of what went on in England, right. a lot of copying of what went on, in my case, mm -hmm. as a perfect example of what was going on in the States. Mm -hmm. Take a look at what they're doing and try to copy it a little. Right, right. There wasn't a lot of uh, generating of new ideas, or even, there wasn't even a lot of uh, uh, copying, enough copying going on. People were, musicians were into playing jazz, mm -hmm. music for music's sake, and the record companies were into distributing foreign product. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't a lot of developing of local talent. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, when when you were of age, you know, to start uh, going to clubs and going to, to, to bars, did you make that crossover to, to listening to, you know, rock records? Those are four to jazz players a lot. I did personally. I've always more been into A and M. Well, A M and F M rock music, I guess. The kind of stuff that you hear on the local top forty radio station always was big to me. I mean, Janet Dean and the Beach Boys, right? Harvey and the Raiders and all that stuff. I mean, that's the stuff that I. I mean, when I went to see Ricky Nelson, right. this was a big turn on. I mean, I really, really got into pop music. Right. I really thought, wow, to be a pop star, a rock star. I mean, Ricky Nelson was the greatest thing that ever lived. The Dave Clark Five were the best group that, in the world, as far right. as I was concerned. I just loved bits and pieces. And, and the leader was the drummer. That's could right. Ask for anything more, you know? <laughs> and it didn't look like he had to do very much. Right. I mean, he, was having, he was having a great time, and, and the music coming out was great. And to me, the scales, right? <laughs> uh, it was it was fabulous. This was a big turn on, and learning to copy like the beat in uh, Glad All Over, Glad All Over, yeah. as a perfect example, and uh, Roy Orbison's record, uh, Pretty Woman. Yeah, I mean, you know, whack, 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 whack. This was a lot of fun. You could actually, I, on my little snare drum, on my cocktail set, I could just <laughs> whack, 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 and, and envision myself playing along with Roy Orbison. This, and I had a great time. And it's still sort of the way that I feel. Yeah. I still feel that unless the music is a lot of fun, right. or unless it's in some other way inspiring, I guess, that I'm not so, I'm really not into the technical side of it. I've had to get into it in the last few years for some of the work that I've done. And it's been a terrific experience and a terrific education. Yeah. You're doing film work and jingles yeah. and that kind of thing, having to read and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But the real driving force for me is the stuff is fun. Right. That music. Right. So you never, like, were really heavy into, you know, going through the formal lessons of all the rudiments and all never the did. stuff. Or some that I wish I had of them, I yeah. think. Yeah. Because I could sure use it now in a lot of the things that I do. When did you when did you, you know, learn how to read? Did you well, again, how did you learn how to read? That's probably the history of uh, <laughs> Toronto again, with all these great jazz players in town. Whenever there were record dates to be done, whenever there were jingles to be done, of course these guys were considered the best musicians, and they were. Yeah. Whether they were right for the particular musical bag or not, they were still considered the upper echelon musicians. So no matter what kind of music almost was being produced, these guys would get called. Yeah. So what you would end up with would be, if they were producing a rock record, it would be a rock record with sort of a jazz sound. Mm -hmm. 
so you'd have maybe a lighter feel on the drums, mm -hmm. smoother feel on the bass, the piano, maybe you'd have a few more ninths and mm -hmm. sevenths and that kind of thing than, than a major kind of feel yep. for yep. those instruments. So I started doing a few studio dates in town. Mm -hmm. And of course, coming from the Dave Clark Five School of Music, you know, that kind of thing, I was a lot more into the sound right. of the drums and the feeling of what was going on, not really having much musical background at all. A few people heard me play and they said, you know, I want you to play my record, or, you know, really that's what started happening. Mm -hmm. And then when I started playing on some records, a few of the arrangers in town said, hey, I want you to play on my jingle. Mm -hmm. But I don't read a lick. Yeah. They said, don't worry, we'll get you through it. I'd rather have you play than this guy who can get it exactly right. I'd rather have it sound like you sound, mm -hmm. right? So I went in and started doing jingles, and people started putting music in front of me. Even though you couldn't read, really honestly, and I really, I wouldn't have, and I wouldn't have a clue. But a few people in town. There's one guy, Eric Robertson, who's a heavy-duty arranger in Toronto, still is. Has done some great, great work. Works with uh, Roger Whittaker. Mm -hmm. uh, he does film dates. He does a lot of stuff out here. He was one of the first guys who started using me. He said, don't worry about it. I'll get you through it. Mm -hmm. So in all of Eric's dates that I did, all the jingles, he would take the part with me, and he would hum. That yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. He would take five minutes with me and say, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And when it's coming to the end, he'd just watch me and I'll sort of show you. And I'd be sitting there with 30, 40 guys, and all of them would know how to read except me. And I'll tell you, boy, I'd like pull up, pull up. Oh yeah, yeah, for you know, for big jingle dates. Yeah. And the, the guy would say, "Okay, let's hear it down." And I'd kind of sit there, and all the guys would look at me, and I just, yeah, and I just listen <laughs> for the first run through, and they're looking at me like, "What is he doing? I'm going to play, man. Yeah, yeah, get this guy to play." And of course, the leader. It was cool because he knew the situation, and I was just kind of listening and kind of trying to follow. I didn't know what a sign was, I didn't know what a coda was, yeah. I didn't know what dotted notes were, I didn't know what ties were. I knew sort of what quarter notes and eighth notes, that kind of thing. I sort of knew what that was about. But repeat signs, anything like that, just <laughs> totally. I mean, if there were 17 bars of music That's all with there repeats was. <laughs> and signs and quotas, I thought there were 17 bars of music. You know, I thought you just went down, and when right. it was over, it was over. Mm -hmm. So the first date I did with Eric was a Lipton, uh, Lipton tea commercial. <laughs> and I thought, all I want to do the first time through when I started playing a big band, like 20, 25 guys, all I want to do is be able to count to the end of the chart. So I thought, okay, ready? I counted it off and started counting. When I got to the end of the chart, and they're still playing. <laughs> I thought, if I can't even count the bars right, I'm in some serious trouble. But anyway, we went through a lot of that for, for I don't know, a couple of months, and I sort of... Uh, Eric helped me with it, and there were a couple of local musicians in town. Mm -hmm. A guy named Jack Zazza, who's been doing the studio work up there for a long time. And they were terrifically supportive and showing me mm -hmm. the basics. And just by working a lot, people, there seemed to be more and more demand for somebody who sounded good as right. opposed to, you know, was technically proficient. A reading whiz or something. Yeah. yeah. And I was sort of filling mm -hmm. a void in, in the city of Toronto where there was probably. You know, a hundred guys in New York and in Los Angeles and Chicago and Memphis, there's probably, you know, mm -hmm. how many hundreds of guys who were that much, who sound that much better than I do, who were more technically trained and all that. But Toronto, because of the way the town sort of developed mm -hmm. musically and economically with the music business and all that, there was sort of a void that I was filling. Yeah. And even though I was so deficient in certain areas, people were using me and I got, I mean, talk about being the luckiest guy in the world. I, they educated me. I was being paid while I was getting an Boy, education, yeah. doing records and doing uh, jingles and television shows and all that stuff. Yeah, and learned as I went. So how did you? How did you? You know, when I heard like um, the last day in L'Oreal, yeah. you were on. Yeah. You know, I assume that that uh, you know that's a pretty heavily produced album. You know, big production thing. But was that the same thing? Just kind of listening. Well, now I read pretty well now. You do read pretty well. Okay. Yes, I do. All right. Having I do, uh, I just did a film with Richard Burton and Tatum O'Neill, having a great big orchestra kind of thing. So mm -hmm. that end of it, I, now I do. I don't know. I do three or four films a year, and I think I do like 250 jingles a year. Wow. I mean, that's a lot of 
a lot of here's your part. Right. So I've had so much of that thrown at me now that I can get through things. Not depending on how difficult the part is, just about down to the point where it's sight reading, mm -hmm. which which is great. Um, so first you develop your ears, and then you read. So you kind of hear what it's supposed to sound like, and then you look at it, and the more you do that, it's. I never really sat down with a book, with a reading book. All the time I kept thinking that it was going to be over, that as soon as I learned how to read, nobody would want to hire me again. Yeah, that kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. break the spell. <laughs> yes, the exactly spell. right. Yeah. And I was sort of afraid to start to really yeah. work at it, yeah. because I thought, I'll be so disappointed, I'll, find, I'll get to be good, I'll get to know what I'm doing, and then nobody will want to yeah, use it. Yeah. <laughs> so I kept thinking, well, you know, these guys are going to, they have to stop calling me. But they didn't. It just seemed to get more and more. The job seemed to get more and more. And I actually, went, I went, in the meantime, I went over to RCA Records. They hired me away from Quality Records in an mm -hmm. A&R capacity. Mm -hmm. And I worked for RCA for seven years at the same time that I was doing the studio. Yes, wow. starting to get into the studio work. And by the end of it, I was, uh, I was president of RCA's publishing divisions mm -hmm. in Canada. And the studio work was so demanding that I had to give the job up at RCA. And that was one of the best record industry jobs in the country up there. But I was, I was so in demand and I was having so much fun now that I had some knowledge of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I was having so much fun and making so much money. I was making twice or three times as much money part-time studio work as I was making as a president in the RCA Corporation. Mm -hmm. there which was a pretty heavy job. Yeah. Things started getting, in my mind, totally out of hand. And I kept fighting, I kept fighting the part-time job because I kept thinking in my mind, it's gotta stop. You know, I'm gonna wake up, the dream will be over, and like that, but kept building. It really did. Are there, are there a lot of, um, you know, in, in, in New York City, you've got that whole, like with Murata and Steve Gett and all of them, is there a sort of a click up in, in Canada, studio boomers like yourself? And, any more two other guys? Well, in the last, um, I would say, in the last five years especially, there's been a lot of, of uh, well, the void that I was filling has certainly been filled, and more so now, with a lot of good rhythm players. Mm -hmm. And I would say there's a good, probably 20 uh, drummers in town, like first call drummers who are who sound good, play well, who do, you know, run the gamut of styles, and, are proficient. That's happened in the last five years, and there's just as many good bass players and just as many pianists and guitarists, and it's gotten to be a very, very good town. Are there any legend like players in Canada that you don't hear about in the States? Oh, I think so. Up there? Yeah. They're just, oh, sure. Um, oh, boy, Tom Sesniak, bass player. Mm -hmm. He works. He worked on one or two of Gord's albums. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, okay. so, yeah, and Murray Stuff, <coughs> we've done together. Mm -hmm. Fine musician plays bass and, and accordion and piano and like and he's, uh, plays percussion with uh, Hey Good Hardy. Mm -hmm. Hey Good has a homecoming mm -hmm. in Canada. Uh, Bob Mann, who moved up to Toronto from New York, mm -hmm. he uh, toured with Herbie Mann. And, oh, what else? He did a Brecker Brothers album or two. I mean, there are some fine musicians in Toronto. Yeah. How did, how did you um, get hooked up with Gordon? And that all come well, that was another uh, crazy thing. I was working at RCA Studios, mm -hmm. and uh, one of my good friends at the studio was an engineer named Mark Smith, mm -hmm. working out of RCA Toronto. And Gordon was going to do an album in Toronto. He had done, I think, the album just before that in Nashville. And I think the one prior to that in Los Angeles. It had been a while since he had recorded in Toronto. And was coming back to Toronto. And Mark was going to engineer the album at RCA. Lenny Warrenker was coming up to produce. Uh, Nick DeCaro was arranging. But they asked Mark to get some musicians. Now, Gordon had Rick Haynes, of course, with him in the group playing bass. And Red Shea was playing guitar. And Terry Clements was playing guitar. I think this was just when Terry was getting to be the guitarist. Red was sort of falling out of the group, mm -hmm. and Terry was coming in. Well, they needed a drummer, they needed a piano player, they needed a steel player, a banjo player, and, and an auto harp player to fill in. So Mark uh, 
introduced me to Gordon, and Mark hired a few of the other players. And we did that album. That was the first, yeah, sorry, it was Old Dan's Records. It was the name of the album. It was 1973 at our school in Toronto. So it just, I sort of happened to be at the right place at the right time. Mark happened to like my playing and worked for him on a few things, a few projects, and he recommended me for the job, and it worked out, worked well. And then from there you started going on the road with Gordon? No, actually not. Um, Gordon had been told by various people for years that you've got to get a drummer, you've got to get a drummer, you've got to get a drummer. And he had always traveled as a trio, mm -hmm. himself, bass, and a lead guitarist. And people knew him as that, mm -hmm. and he was comfortable in that uh, size unit. He didn't really want to have a drummer. I played so simply and I guess was uh, different from any other drummers he'd worked for in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, really playing as little as possible, which was halfway due to my lack of knowledge, I guess, and halfway due to just wanting to do a good job. I guess I figured if I could play a little bit well, yeah. you know, it seemed to work. I, was, I guess it was definitely partially luck and partially some kind of sense of what was right for the music, having listened to a lot of records of it. Uh, it seemed to work, so he asked me if I'd be interested in doing a weekend with him. He had a weekend booked. So we had a couple of rehearsals at Massey Hall, and yeah. everything worked fine. And he called me a couple of days before and said, listen, man, I got cold feet. I've been on the road so long without a drummer. I just, I'm worried like crazy. I just don't want to do it. Uh, it was fine. I mean, he was very honest with me, very upfront. It was disappointing, of course. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, he was completely honest with me, told me the truth, which he uh, has always done. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I didn't see him for a couple of years. And then he phoned me in the fall of 75. Was getting ready to do another album and was this time very seriously considering adding a drummer to the group. So we got together and rehearsed for the Summertime Dream album. And things worked out well again, and arrived at uh, a deal that was good for both of us. He, see, the thing was, I'd never really done any serious touring with anyone, mm -hmm. and he had never had a drummer. So we really had to feel each other out. I wasn't sure really if it was going to work for me, and he really wasn't sure if it was going to work for him. Mm -hmm. So I started, all the other guys in the band were on a weekly salary. And I decided, and Gordon agreed, that it would be best if I was paid on a daily basis. You pay as you play, which I thought was great. I wasn't committed to him in case it didn't work. He wasn't committed to me in case it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And it's been that way. I've been with him for five years. It's never changed. It's never changed. <laughs> it's, it's worked out great. Yeah. 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 When, when you're doing rehearsals with, with the album with Gordon, does he pretty much come in and know what he wants, or, or is it more of a group effort in terms of getting arrangements together in the songs? Gordon, when it comes to recording and when it comes to concerts, is the leader of the group in every sense of the word. Mm -hmm. He does all the arranging. Uh, there's a lot of input that comes from the other guys, but really he knows. He really has an idea of what he wants in a song, of what a song should feel like, what it should sound like. Mm -hmm. um, he controls all the tempos. He controls the, uh, uh, each individual instrument, really, how it's arranged for the particular song. So, he really is, in every sense of the word, the, the leader of the group. The, the different, uh, um, the thing that really impressed me, you know, when I, when I listened to you on record the first time, when, and it, it, I think even in concert too, the nice thing about the band is that it's a band sound, you know, and that nobody really stands out. Yet, if you dissect with your ears the different instruments, there's so many little subtle things going on. And uh, when I started listening to, you know, really seriously sitting down and listening to the drum parts on the record, you know, you do a lot of really nice and, like you said, subtle and simple things, but, but tasty, you know, really tasty things. And um, I was wondering if, if the different things you use, the bells and the chimes, and things, is that your, your ideas or are these kind of things Gordon would say, hey, wow, you know, why don't we have a little bells here or maybe you could add some triangles here or something. Well, different things came from different sources. Mm -hmm. Some of the ideas were Gordon's, some of them were mine. Mm -hmm. And the triangles and the mark tree, now that's been right. added on the stage, 
came from uh, the last album that we did. We worked with a percussionist named Lenny Castro mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. He's worked with Boss Gags and Melissa Manchester and uh, Rick Lee Jones. Mm -hmm. He was hired. Worked done a lot of work with Lenny Warnaker and Russ Teitelman, the two producers on Gordon's album. And Gordon thought it might be an idea just for change to have a percussionist on all the basic tracks. Mm -hmm. So Lenny was on the tracks. He played a lot of the stuff, a lot of the very tasty percussion stuff that has stayed in the arrangements, and I tried to incorporate as much of it as I can. What is that big bell? That is a, <coughs> I believe that's called a fog bell, mm -hmm. and we use that only in the Ghost of Cape Horn. Yeah. It's only in one section yeah. for that sort of haunting. Uh, Pretty impressive looking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Jeez, what kind of a cow that can be. Yeah, that's what, that gets set up, and I think I think it is struck twice a night. That's it. Yeah. Extra bag of cow. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh. With, um, um, I want to ask, I guess, ask a couple of technical things for the sure. people that read. With, um, well, um, the sound you have now with Gordon, okay, it's pretty, it's very deep sounding drums, low, and, 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 and the studio sound, I guess you could call it. Okay. Is that something that uh, you pretty much stick with? Is that your sound, or do you, do you, you know, experiment with your tunings and so forth from uh, from uh, you know, gig to gig, or whatever? Well, Gordon is the only artist that I tour with. Mm -hmm. All the other work that I do is is in the form of studio work, either television, uh, jingles, records. It's all it's all studio work except for Gordon. Um, and with with his band and with the sound that he gets, I'm able to take a studio sounding kit mm -hmm. because of the volume that everyone else plays at, right? Because of the volume that the band projects, the sound of the drums slightly muffled and slightly, you know, the tuning being just so. I think the sound of the instrument itself is a little more important in this band mm -hmm. than it is in some others where the amplification maybe, or the uh, sound mixer yeah. has a chance to do a lot more and say oh, well, in almost any other band is louder than we are. Right. Rock bands. Right. So <clears> I can uh, I have to make sure that the drums themselves sound to my ear very good because that's almost what's going to be heard in the house. Mm -hmm. There's not that much amplification that goes on. Mm -hmm. With Sometimes we're working with two acoustic guitars, bass guitar, and a little bit of steel. There's not a lot of noise going on for me to... Right. There's a lot of dynamics that have to be observed in this group. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's great that, that I can work with a studio sound and kit in the band because that's the way I do most of my work, and that's what I'm used to. Mm -hmm. And that set that I use with Gordon, when I first joined him, I bought specifically specifically for this job, and that's pretty much all that that set of drums is used for. Mm -hmm. So they are tuned just for that. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Very occasionally, at home, I have five sets of drums. Mm -hmm. Very occasionally, <laughs> if I get so busy in town, I'll pull that set out and use them for something. Yeah. If I have four or five different dates in a day and they're all in different places, I have to have sets set up mm -hmm. all over the place and maybe not have time to set them up before yeah. from one date to another. So right. they have to be set up. Mm -hmm. and, and I may need so many sets of drums that I may have to use that set. And I've used them a few times in Toronto for mm -hmm. different dates. But almost exclusively, they're used only for Gordon's concert. So they can stay tuned for the stage, how they sound, yeah. for for his sound on the stages that we play, and it's, it's great. And that's it. Yeah. What are they? Are they Slingwood? Oh, premier. They are Premier. Okay. Right. What uh, different sizes? Okay, the uh, bass drum, 20-inch bass drum. Yeah. Uh, the Tom Toms, well, they're not exclusively a Premier kit. Right. <laughs> that's, I've got an 8 and 10-inch Ludwig concert toms. Yeah. 12-inch, uh, 14-inch, 16 inch mm -hmm. premier tom toms. Mm -hmm. The snare drum is a 7 inch Ludwig chrome. 
then I have the couple of French symbols. Uh, I have the yeah, no rice symbols. No, 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 no call for that. No call at all whatsoever. The what uh, you have a, a favorite set that you pretty much use in the studios? Uh, you have, if you got five sets of drums, is it five different sets or just about? Yeah, I have a set of. Uh, <coughs> premieres at home mm -hmm. that are older than this set, but in terms of size and sound, they're almost identical to the set that I use with Gordon. Mm -hmm. And I've used them on uh, Gordon's albums, all the stuff I've done with Gordon, all the stuff I did with Andy Murray. Yeah. I just did you know, a couple of Roger Whittaker albums. Mm -hmm. For that kind of a sound, mm -hmm. I love them. And it's the same. Uh, eight to ten inch Ludwig concert tiles. Uh, don't ask me why, it just sort of happened that way. And the rest of the set is premier. Yeah. Uh, and various, I think I've got ten snare drums at home. I use different snare drums. All chrome? Yes, they are. Everyone. Uh, different sizes, different makes, for different sounds for different things. No wood, sir? No. I tried one wood one time and I, it just didn't work for some reason. Mm -hmm. It seems like I'll use. Some clients will ask for a certain snare drum sound, and if I don't have it in my arsenal, I'll go out and try to buy what I think in my own mind would give me that sound, and then work on it at the studio. And then what usually ends up happening with me, or what has happened historically, is that it will usually work out very well, mm -hmm. and I'll just buy it from the store. Mm -hmm. Now I got another snare drum, and I know what that <coughs> sounds like for a certain sound, for a certain thing, yeah. and how it responds, and I just put it away. And next time I need a sound, like that, I'll just go to the closet, yeah. just to write it out. Then I have another set of drums, which is uh, uh, completely a Ludwig set, mm -hmm. with uh, one head there, Vispolite, made of Vispolite. Oh, okay. When I say one head, I, there's no bottom head right. on any of the tops. And I use them for rock and roll and disco dates. Mm -hmm. I was doing a lot of disco work when disco was hot. Yeah. And they work great for that. A little more uh, bang boom out of it. Mm -hmm. Not quite as much tone no. as the premieres I found, but a little more action, a little more maybe excitement for the mm -hmm. rock and disco kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I was doing that. I was doing a disco album once every two months or something. Yeah. I was part of a part of a little disco factory. In I heard a thing about disco music. This blew my mind. That, What's that with the drummers, that what they do is they'll get the drummers to play about eight measures, and then that's it. And then they'll just rather than the drummer playing all through a disco tune, they will just repeat the track over and over with the drummer. Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> I've I've well, also we're... heard of that, and many times I wish that happened. But, that's <laughs> but I worked for this company in Toronto, and it's the truth. And we did uh, the THP Orchestra stuff. Yeah. And a lot of that stuff was very successful. Yeah. With uh, Butterfly Records, Atlantic Records, mm -hmm. and three top ten disco albums. And we had uh, a top twenty album called Sticky Fingers on Kelly Records. Mm -hmm. We had a top ten record with uh, the Duncan Sisters on Casablanca. I, there was a whole flock of albums that did very, very well. And it was the same producers, the same engineer, the same studio, and the same basic rhythm section, mm -hmm. the same arranger, and it was it really was a team. We would do an album like every two months, and it would be a different artist. An artist would fly in from Memphis, or an artist from Los Angeles, a mm -hmm. uh, different record company. But these two guys produced these records, and their concept of it was that if, a, if the... Uh, the piece was going to be 12 minutes long. They wanted the band to play for 12 minutes. So when I knew these disco records were coming up, and this is the truth, I would go out and work out a week before. Work out? What is it? How? I'd go out and run four miles a day, maybe, that kind of thing. Is that right? Because when I play disco, I play, I play two different styles on the bass drum. One is the sort of heel to toe right. method, and yeah. the other one is the straight pound the leg down on the right. bass pedal style. And for disco, that's right. That's it, that's it right there. <laughs> now you start playing for 12 minutes. Doing this. Doing that, right? Okay? And maybe 16 on the hi-hat yeah. kind of thing. And you start, you won't believe how you start sweating after a while. Now you do that on a six-hour date, where all you've got to do, maybe 16 on the hi-hat, 
pound the snare drum and pound that bass drum like that. Start doing that for six hours, and you better be in shape. <laughs> I'm serious. And when they say to you, when you put, sometimes you can feel when it's a take, when you're in the studio. Everybody plays just right, and there's a yeah. certain magic that happens, and you feel. Now, sometimes you're right, and sometimes you're wrong. And you start playing your heart out. I mean, really, you start going into overdrive. So mm -hmm. when you start playing, all the fills just feel right. You start playing maybe a little harder, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Everybody sort of gets into it. You run down a 12-minute disco song that you thought was the take. You put everything into it. And then the voice over the earphone says, almost. Let's try it one more time. <laughs> right? yeah. You're sweating, you're bleeding. <laughs> you know? And they say, that was almost there. You say, OK, let's try it again. Ready? One, two. And you've got to do it again for the next 12 minutes. Now you better be in shape. And all of those albums that I did with them, it may have, I don't know, 10 or 12 albums, they did. Basically the same kind of stuff. all playing all this or what? Wow. None of, they never used a drum loop at all for any of the stuff. All of it was done live with a good exception. Right. Three guys from Toronto. There's myself, a guitarist named Brian Russell, a percussionist named Dick Smith, mm -hmm. and three guys from Memphis that were for me. A guitarist named Michael Tolles, we played on uh, Isaac Hayes stuff. Mm -hmm. with, uh, David from Shaft. Yeah, I've done a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, bass player named Errol Thomas, mm -hmm. same thing. Worked with Isaac Hayes, done all that stuff. And a keyboard player named Carl Marsh, mm -hmm. who's done a lot of producing and managing. And that was the basic rhythm section, the six guys. They cut all this right. That's incredible. I always thought they ran like tape loops on that stuff. Some of them did, but I'll tell you, I got in shape in a hurry. You <laughs> paid the pound, huh? Oh. <laughs> it was Jog. fun, but wow. Jogging through my head. Bleeding and... Yeah. Do you have any um, um, interest outside of music that you, uh, you know, really, from a philosophical approach that you use like when you play or at all? Is that well, too heavy? So. No, it isn't at all. I, <laughs> Should we dim the lights for that question? <laughs> no, I think it's a very good question. I think the mental aspect of playing, I think, is, is extremely important in the studio. I think your attitude, how you react with other people, I think is, is either equally as important or more important than what you play. I think how you act with all those other people. When you're locked in a room sometimes for 12 and 15 hours with people, creative people. No exit. No exit. When you're in there creating and people are bouncing ideas off. I mean, if you don't get along or if you're on some kind of trip somewhere, it just is not, I don't care how good a player you are, it's not going to work, especially in a rhythm section. You guys have got to work together and you got to, I play, when I'm not playing music, I play baseball and football. Big team sport man. And I think a lot of the same thinking goes into making a good baseball team, making a good football team goes into making good records, goes into making good product in the studio. You need guys in a football team, you need a quarterback, you need flashy receivers and flashy runners, and you need some guys who are going to block them. Right. A lot of that goes into making a good record. A lot of times if the record is supposed to feature a lead vocalist with a lot of lyrics, I mean, they're the running backs, and the bass player and the drummer should be the guard blocking for them setting up a solid foundation, making sure that what's supposed to happen happens and don't get in their way. Right. Don't try to steal their thunder and don't try to... I mean, really, I, think I know. That's, that's a good question. Um, I just blanked out. I had another good question, too. Can <laughs> <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? Oh, uh, yeah, I do. Because I, 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 that, that's a good analogy with the baseball team that I often thought about. Definitely. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Okay. That well, you've been with Gordon since 70... Toward the beginning of '76, and it's my fifth year. All right. That now, to me, the, the longevity of the players within this band yes. is what makes it a band, and that's where the, the team comes in. And um, do you? It seems to me that, that um, there's kind of a lull in music right now, and that seems to me to be a big fault of it. That there really are no bands coming out like in, in the yeah, that's true. You know, '60s, unless. Um, are there any hiding in Canada that we hear? A little bit of line right off the top of my head. There's an awfully good group in Toronto called Rough Trade, who I think are going to break out and be heard by a lot of people very soon. They've, had, they've come very close 
to being very big and popular times, you know, and they overdue to hurt them. Why do you think Gordon's been able to, uh, well, I don't know if it is just Gordon, but why do you think more you musicians have been able to stay together this long? Uh, I think the combination of musical tastes and styles of the different guys, certainly the personalities, we all get along extremely well. And when I say that, I, I'm not just saying the four of us, I'm talking about the five of us with Gordon as well. Because he treats us like a band. It's In his eyes, it's a band. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a singer plus four side men. Yeah. He doesn't have, he doesn't project to us the star image. I'm the star and you guys are the band. It's not like that at all with him. It's like we're a five piece band and I'm the lead singer. That kind of a thing. And I think that says a lot for his attitude and our attitude. I mean, we realize, of course, that he's the star and he's the main man and everything like that, but he has respect for the band and the individual players, and I think it's sort of a mutual respect. That helps a lot. We get along very well on the road. We don't travel as much, probably, as a lot of other acts. Gordon does uh, usually about 70 dates a year, which is a lot fewer dates than most other people. That may have something to do with it. You don't go out on the road for right. six weeks at a time when you want to kill somebody. You go out for a week for a week for a week home and the next week come home and then maybe go out for a week or something. Yeah. So it's always refreshing to see the guys again. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the people in their playing, we complement each other. Again, much like the sports team. Right. Where certain people have their certain jobs and and, and have their feeling of pride and respect in handling that job and not stepping over into somebody else's territory, not stealing the limelight at the wrong time kind of thing. We do support each other musically and in all other respects. And it just seems to yeah. it seems to work that way. Yeah, it definitely shows that that's the way it sounds, you know, when you hear the band and say, you know, that seems that's the way it has to be, you know, otherwise the music wouldn't wouldn't sound like that's not a one man sound. Yeah. It's definitely a unit. I think it's. I think this band is pretty unique in that respect too. I think the fact that we've been together so long, and uh, the kind of music that is, it, Gordon, is different. I mean, his music is Gordon Lightfoot is Gordon Lightfoot, and uh, I think it's a, a quite a unique situation the way that the band projects the music and yeah. the music and the whole concert. I think is is kind of unique. It was an interesting change. I remember last year when, when you were here and you were doing songs off Dream Street Rose, Gordon was almost, a, well, he, he was, a, yeah, I guess kind of apologetic almost in a way. That he was, you know, knowing knows remember not, that? Yeah. You know, I've seen him a lot of times in concert and it's always back to the old, you know, the favorite tones and requests and that kind of thing. And last year it seemed like so many new songs that, mm -hmm. that people hadn't heard before. He was nervous about doing that, you know, and there was such great tunes, you know, it was almost like, wow. Yeah. Well, he feels that he wants to inject any new material that he can. He wants the people to hear new material. He gets an awful lot of requests for the, the good old stuff, right. and uh, he certainly respects the, the material that got him to where he is, and he mm -hmm. loves that stuff as much as the fans do. Right. But he feels the uh, quotation usually uses the Shakespeare to thine own self be true. Mm -hmm. He feels that he wants to present the new material and wants people to hear it. Mm -hmm. He feels badly sometimes that that he will present a new song and it will take the place of maybe someone's old favorite that they came to hear. Right. That he feels he doesn't want to sit and do a three hour concert, which he could do. He feels that people don't want to sit that long and listen. He wants them to to, uh, you know, he wants it to be an hour and a half concert, he wants them to enjoy it, he doesn't want them to be bored. Yeah. So he presents the best of what he has and he will always present the material in front of him. Yeah, I thought it was good. I think Dreams, because um, there seemed to be, almost be a transition period within the band, and Endless Wire almost seemed to mark the end of a, of a musical style, and then I don't know if that's accurate or, or if you felt that way as, as players or if there was that thing going on within the band or Dream Street Rose just seemed to be like a you know, a whole new takeoff point. It was really uh, really refreshing. It was a good sound. 
I don't know if I heard it as quick. Yeah. It's Mark Richmond. Maybe she did there. That's interesting. But I'm pretty close to it too. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, did you, uh, Dream Street Rose was not recorded last time you were here then? Or had it been in the can and then you went out on tour to help? No, we recorded it in November in Los Angeles. And we were here, we were in Saratoga. About the same so You were playing the songs here that had not been recorded. That's yet. correct. Yeah. We did the whole album in 10 days in Los Angeles. Out at the Warner Brothers studio. What's up and coming? Record? Well, we have a lot of dates to do uh, this summer. We're playing a lot in August and September. Um, have you ever thought about doing a live album with the band? He's thought about it. Yeah. He's toyed with a few different ideas. He's toyed with the live album. He's toyed with adding a string section sometimes, mm -hmm. maybe working with an orchestra. We almost did that in Lake Tahoe one time. Yeah. But uh, it was the first time he played in a, in a big so-called Nevada mm. casino type oh, yeah. dinner club and it was just too many brand new things at once. So that almost oh, happened. Again. Well, it, it <laughs> a little bit, the same kind of idea that uh, we've done it this way for so long. How would you feel about doing a live album? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Have you, have you uh, done that much at all before? Do you tape it all in the concerts? When you tour, for the only your own sakes to hear back material, or no, really, the only things that we've heard would be things that were taped by other people. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we did a radio show, yeah, out of Lincoln Center a couple of Christmases ago, mm -hmm. and we did a soundstage TV show last summer out of Chicago. Really, that's the only time when mm -hmm. someone else wants to use the concert for mm -hmm. their own purposes. That'd be Dynamo, a live album. You, you guys really sound Dynamo live. Yeah, thank you. Is that make up? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Is there a new album coming up? Uh, I know, or <laughs> Did I? The thing was never turned on. Could I be excused for 60 seconds to use the powder? Well, I guess so. Would that break the concentration? <laughs> okay. And listen, if you want to say anything, and I'm not coming, you know. Okay. Feel free to do so. Will I scream it? You know, or anything. 